Welcome to the HCI Family of Podcasts, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We share our own original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. Join us for practitioner-oriented content around all things leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with the HCI family of podcasts. Alison Jones, welcome to the conversation today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. It is a real pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from London. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about gender diversity, Uh, gender diversity generally within the workplace, but also specifically within the chemicals world. That's your expertise and how that compares to gender diversity in other STEM fields. Uh, And this is really zooming in on a specialty kind of more niche area, uh, more specifically than we've ever discussed Uh, on this podcast before. We've talked about gender diversity. We've talked about even within STEM fields before, but we've never really zoomed in in this particular way before. So I'm excited to have this conversation and to uh, have you share your expertise with us. As we get started, I wanted to share Allison's bio with everybody. Allison Jones joined ICIS in 2020 after 18 years at Bloomberg where she ran the investment research business. At ICIS, she plays a significant role in championing the business's purpose and leading its long-term growth strategy. Allison is passionate about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and she has previously represented Bloomberg on the board of London's Women's Forum, a network of senior women within the financial services industry, and is an executive sponsor of the Relics Menopause Employee Resource Group. Allison loves trying to keep fit, running, cycling, and Pilates when she gets the chance given her second job as a taxi service to her two children. I can definitely resonate with that. I have six children. Um, and so that that constant like running people <laughs> around, going to and fro, man, oh that's a, a big part of the gig as a parent. And uh, I, I get that. Um, you have such a great background, a wonderful career. Thank you so much for sitting down with me. Anything you would like to highlight by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in? Yes, absolutely. So um, like you you introduced, John, I've been with ICIS for about four years now. My role is the Chief Strategy Officer, so responsible for the business strategy, the growth strategy of ICIS, which is an independent commodities intelligence provider. And I am, I like to call myself an enthusiastic amateur, but I'm sure certainly I'm enthusiastic in the space of DE and I. Um, I feel incredibly strongly that in order for business strategies to be effective, to work, the DE and I strategy is as important for that to work alongside. So, um, like I say, an enthusiastic amateur. I'm certainly not a professional in this field, but I'm really excited about having this discussion with you today. Excellent. And again, thank you. Uh, I think an enthusiastic amateur is a great uh, place to be. I, you know, I think we we all have various places where we have our expertise, and then we have a lot of places, probably most places, where we are enthusiastic amateurs. And uh, the world is full of those, and we need those as well. And, and in fact, you know, that's probably most of what most of us do. Um, okay, let's let's dive on in and talk about the the current state of gender diversity in the chemicals world um, and how that's changed over the years. And maybe actually you can start by talking about the chemicals world more generally and then dig into the gender diversity piece. Absolutely. So I joined ICIS and started my career within the chemicals industry only four years ago. And like you said, I'd worked for 18 years in the financial markets. Again, data and analytics, but it was the financial markets. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I got the call about this role and I just started laughing and I said to the guy, I went, have you, have you, have you lost the plot? I mean, why would, what have I got to give the chemicals industry? Anyway, I sat down with a gentleman at partway through the interview process and he talked to me about the criticality and the role that chemicals play in our world. And I had never appreciated it. And if you think about where we're sat today, I'm presuming, John, that you're sat in front of a laptop, you've got your phones, um, you're probably wearing some, it might be, it might be a natural uh, 
cotton jumper, but you may have synthetic fibers on you. And the chemicals industry touches, I think it's in the region of 96 or 97 percent of manufactured goods. And I think the interesting piece around it is that, you know, it's not a brand. You don't see it on the sh shelves in shops of, uh, you know, the local supermarket per se. So that it's an industry that's almost in some ways a little bit invisible, but has such a huge impact on the world. And I think to me, I'd always had this connotation before joining that it's a bit of a dirty industry. I was like, chemicals, it just has that word. However, when I started to embed myself into the industry and having these conversations, the role that it plays and the criticality of the industry it play, uh, the role that industry plays in driving innovation and solving some of the biggest problems that we, from a societal standpoint, are facing is insane. Um, things around how to solve for plastic waste, how to support the transition to net zero. The chemicals industry plays such a critical role in that those transitions and in solving those problems. I was hooked. Um, obviously, as part of that, a huge part of that is really around innovation. Everybody has to innovate. The industry has to innovate in order to solve these problems and in order to solve these societal and world problems. And therefore, critical to innovation, as I'm sure everybody and all your listeners know, is that diversity of thought. Now, coming from a financial industry background of 18 years and coming into a chemical industry for the last four, I was like, yeah, I sure do pick the industries, uh, very mm. male dominated by historical background. But my Lord, that it is changing. The conversation, the dialogue is changing within the industry. We're starting to make progress, but there is still a long way to go. So the first piece is on that attracting. How do you attract talent into the organization or into the organization, into the industry, should I say? But then how do you retain them? How do you develop? How do you get that sense of purpose and support uh, women on their career um, ambitions? And from in the last four years since I've joined, I've seen the conversation changing, the dialogues are increasing, um, associations, all of them have um, initiatives and panel discussions at events on the criticality of gender diversity. A lot of the bigger players, it's quite a fragmented um, value chain chemicals. So there's some big players and there's some very small players. So a lot of the bigger players are hiring into um, DNI professionals to drive forward that agenda. Um, and in many ways, most excitingly, is I'm really getting this sense that the industry is feeling we have to act together. If we act together on all of this, we'll be stronger and we'll innovate, mm. not only around DNI, but really in how they're going to transform and support those, those major problems um, and solve those major societal problems. And we've seen the emergence of quite a number of nonprofit organizations. Um, there's one that I must mention, and I'm a huge supporter of them, and it's um, an organisation called the Women in Chemicals, um, set up by two amazing inspirational women, um, Amelia and Kylie, who have a job in the chemicals industry, yet have set up this not-for-profit organisation. It's got thousands of members now, over even in the last three to four years, whereby they are empowering this, if you like, groundswell of female empowerment and support network to really start driving change and enhancing and driving that conversation in the um, the industry. Whether we're talking about, I mean, any industry, any yeah. type of job, particularly when we get into STEM field or into the chemical world, um, you know, you, you elucidated a lot of the challenges, I think, um, face these various industries and these different types of jobs um, that have been historically male dominated, that have been historically uh, a challenge um, in recruiting women. And then, like you said, retaining women. Um, and just, you know, I can't fully relate to this, right? I'm a dude. 
and first of all, uh, second of all, I'm I'm not in the chemicals world, and I'm I'm not specifically in STEM. I'm a professor. I I uh, am in the higher ed, and I teach um, you know organizational behavior and HR and those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, but I but I'm adjacent to the STEM world, and here yeah. in Utah, here in Utah, we have um, you know a pretty bustling tech um, hub uh, called Silicon Slopes. It's it's uh, kind of playing off of, um, you know, Silicon Valley in the Bay area. And we have some unicorns and we have a lot of tech, tech startups and a lot of, um, tech companies that have their headquarters here. And so it's a vibrant, uh, tech community and, and doing consulting work and, and work with some of the, the tech firms here. Um, you know, I've had conversations with them that sound a lot like what you were just describing <laughs> and, your, and, and, and how you were explaining your experience that, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's hard a lot of times for them to even attract um, women into their workplaces who have just, they just don't see themselves in it. They, they, they look at it and they're like, why would I want to go into that male dominated workplace? Um, you know, and they have those questions and, um, anyways, it's, 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 it's an uphill battle, right. Um, to, to try to get to that space. And then if you are successful in, in recruiting, now you get, you know, a great, highly qualified, uh, person, a, a, a woman into that workplace. And if you haven't done the work to actually have like an inclusive culture, an inclusive environment, you know, they may just show up and not feel welcome, not feel valued, not have a sense of belonging. And then they may just turn around and leave because they don't want to be in a place where they they don't feel like they're included. And, and then you just have that revolving door. And, and so it doesn't actually solve anything. Um, and, and that's, that's one of the challenges, you know, that, that the organ, the STEM organizations are, are facing here. Uh, and it may very well be similar to what, you know, you're experiencing, um, have you, have you, you know, as we, as we look at gender diversity in chemicals compared to gender diversity in STEM generally, where you're at, uh, have you noticed those types of, um, things or, or what are some of the differences? So from where I was previously, so if I think about, again, being in the financial markets to here and taking a personal view here, um, I haven't, got exposure, I wouldn't be able to talk eloquently across all of STEM fields, sure, sure. but I definitely do see that pyramid effect, mm -hmm. whereby, you know, we get, we're able to attract where possible, but then there isn't that support. So I fully, I'm totally with you, John, in terms of the criticality of having that inclusive framework to allow the progression of female talent through the organization. Um, I do and have heard from a lot of speaking to a lot of women within the industry that they also do face that or that they get within their organization to a certain level. And then because of um, choices, lifestyle choices and family, elder care, same that can face men too. Isn't This is not just a female sure. um, yeah. challenge. Um, you know, they might not be able to make the commitment and or they don't see others like them at the top, so they don't then um, push themselves forward as much. However, I do feel that in certain segments of the industry, we are starting to see more senior women, more CEOs who are taking and being those beacons, if you like, and those role models for the younger generations coming up, and also those in um, that middle layer of management I do see the mentorship and role modeling and sponsorship and allyship you mentioned as as we know uh, you're a man male sponsorship is such a critical element on how to create that environment where we can see that progression all the way through at all stages of career progression through any industry I do think within STEM there has been, um, and I'm talking specific to the UK here, and I'd love your perspectives on this, John, from the, the US markets, is that we are starting to see simple things like in textbooks, for example, more female scientists or more female senior right. role models being put forward that 
almost drives that ambition and that sense of attainment of possibility from the younger generations. Um, I'm not from a STEM background. I'm actually a politics uh, background as I was trained in politics. And I I went to uh, my daughter's school and I walked around. And when I was at school, STEM and that job trying to um, encourage women into STEM subjects, it wasn't there. I mean, it was quite a long time ago, but it wasn't there. And I was looking at secondary schools for my daughter a little while ago. And I came out, I was covered in goosebumps because I was walking down the corridor of a school and there were posters everywhere of influential and successful women from STEM. And I, I'm getting goosebumps now even talking about it. And it does change your perspective on the art of the possible and potential career routes that I think mm. are often closed off or were closed off historically. And I think there is a lot more work being done in terms of creating that inclusive culture, again, through associations and or non-for-profits, companies working together and individually to offer enhanced sponsorship, enhanced allyship, enhanced development plans. There's still a long way to go. I am not saying we're there at all. Yeah. Yeah. But I feel we're going in the right direction. But I'd I'd love your view and perspective if you see that happening in the states. I, I will say it's it is improving, yeah. um, but it it's a challenge. Yeah, we we talk Absolutely. about it, you know, as a faculty all the time about how we need to proactively be um, giving voice to women and providing yes. more visibility to women leaders. Because to be honest, in a lot of the textbooks uh, or a lot of the case studies um, that we use in our classes, if we only use, you know, what the publishers provide, um, it tends to be almost exclusively men, male dominated, right? So mo most of the case studies are men. Uh, most of the examples in the textbooks are men. <clears throat> and so it, it, for the most part, we have to proactively go out and find our own. Um, that is changing slowly, and thankfully that is. But um, I, I would say we're—I I would say generally it's we're behind on that, and yeah. and uh, it's it's something we're aware of, and and so I think professors, at least where I'm at, we're certainly aware of it, and we're talking about it, and we're trying to proactively correct for it in how we teach our yeah. courses and how we develop our course materials. Um, but, but yeah, it's because it has a huge, a huge impact, you know, who I bring in as guest speakers, uh, the types of case studies we, we use, um, the examples we use. And if we're only ever sharing examples about men, you know, it, in, in, you know, at least in, in my programs, I'm a department chair. I have three different majors in my department and, and we're pretty much evenly split pretty close to 50, 50 male, female, and the student body and in, in, in our programs you know, as well as faculty, thankfully. Um, and so luckily the students do get to see men and women faculty, but if, if we only ever use male examples as CEOs and as executives, then we're failing them, you know, cause we're not giving them a vision of what they're capable of and what they can aspire to. No, it's, it's so true. And it's, it's almost like we have to have that intentionality yeah. and you have to be constantly thinking about it. It's not yet, in the DNA of how many people work, operate, how firms are. It's not in the fabric yet. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what needs to change. And until that happens, there has to be that intentionality. There has to be the conversation still happening to drive that forward. So back to your first question. Yes, I'm seeing it improve, but we've got a long way to go still. I, I, know, th I know at the time I'm going to need to let you go here in just a minute, but maybe before we wrap up, you know, if you were to say one or two things that organizations could do right now, like today, to start to, yeah. to move things forward, to move the needle um, towards greater gender diversity, equity and inclusion, what would those be? For me, it's, I really believe, and I'm talking predominantly in the industries that I operate, is there is value in working together. I really do believe that if industries and companies work together, they will be stronger and they will be more impactful and more effective. Um, I do also believe very strongly in 
the power of almost like top down charters and also the bottom up um, groundswell of empowerment, if you like. And that's why, again, these external bodies that are coming to drive that support. But I think what is critical is not to focus on just, I need a more diverse workforce. It's, as you said, John, it's around you can't have a diverse workforce without having an inclusive culture. So you need to create the right environment, the right inclusive culture where people do have, to your point, that sense of purpose, that sense of belonging, so that you can ensure that this is happening through all the life cycle. So the attraction of the talent, the retention of the talent, and then that development of the talent. But I do say it's, I've always in my career looked for external groups, associations that I can help and contribute to, because I think from that, even sharing sharing of voice, sharing of ideas and thoughts, what's worked, what hasn't worked, that's how we all get there quicker. Yeah, yeah, well said. Well, it has just been a real pleasure talking with you. Uh, I appreciate your insights. As we wrap up, I wanted to give you a chance, Allison, to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Fantastic. Thank you so much, John. That has gone so quickly. I can't quite believe it. (laughs) (laughs) I could have talked to you for a lot longer. So thank you so much for having me. Yes, please do connect. I'm on LinkedIn, Alison Jones at ICIS. And like I said, I look forward to, to contributing to conversations and I hope to connect with people. Please feel free to connect with me and I'd love to share ideas and thoughts on how we can accelerate gender diversity within STEM fields and of course, within the chemicals industry. Thank you. Thank you so much. I encourage the audience to reach out, to get connected, find out more about what Allison can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you stay healthy and safe and please join us again soon.